Thank you, Catherine, for the nice introduction. Good evening, and thank you all for coming. My talk is based on research done in connection with an upcoming exhibition, The Timeless Genius of Leonardo da Vinci, the Draftsman, opening at the Metropolitan Museum of Art on the 21st of January, 2003. Um, and it's with great pleasure that I can say that most of the drawings that you'll be seeing tonight have already been agreed to for the exhibition at the Met. On your left, a photograph of the President and Mrs. John F. Kennedy posing with Leonardo's Mona Lisa in Washington. And on your right, you see a slide of the Mona Lisa installed at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. In 1963, the President and Mrs. Kennedy arranged with the French government for Leonardo's painting to leave its permanent home at the Musée du Louvre in Paris to come to America for a couple of months. Leonardo's Mona Lisa was exhibited at the Met in New York and at the National Gallery of Art in Washington. Just to recapture the event at the Met, the Mona Lisa was exhibited from the 7th of February to the 4th of March, and in less than one month, 1,077,000 people came to see it in the Great Medieval Sculpture Hall. On the left is another archival photo of the Mona Lisa being packed in a crate at the Met in 1963, and you can see how worried the guy is on the right. <laughs> For 19th century and 20th century critics, Leonardo da Vinci, perhaps more so than any other figure of his time, uh, has offered a paradigm of the Renaissance polymath. He was an artist who produced ineffably beautiful, mythical paintings. He was also a brilliant theorist, scientist, and inventor whose work has spoken across the centuries with an astonishingly modern voice. Yet the actual number of his extant paintings is very small, just about 15, if we were to count finished and unfinished paintings, autograph and partly autograph paintings. Even more surprisingly, there are only five extant paintings produced by him after 1500, and that is if we were to count generously. During his lifetime, Leonardo's inability to finish projects was legendary. Piero Soderini, the chief government official of the Florentine Republic, complained in 1506 to the representative of the French king about Leonardo's failed Battle of Anghiari mural, and I quote him, he made a very small beginning of a very large thing, end of quote. Around 1513, when Pope Leo X de Medici learned that Leonardo was incessantly fussing over recipes for varnishes instead of painting, he explained, he exclaimed, and I quote him, alas, this man will never do anything, for he begins by thinking about the end before the beginning of his work, end of quote. What did Leonardo do in the last 20 years of his life? He at least drew incessantly. An enormous body of drawings by Leonardo survives, close enough to 3,000 in number. And these offer the key to understanding his work during the last 20 years of his life. From Milan in December 1499, he moved repeatedly from place to place in search of patient patrons. He was virtually an itinerant artist and an all-purpose wise man until his death in Clue in France in 1519. On the left is Leonardo's study from 1506 for the head of the screaming soldier Niccolo Piccinino in the unfinished Battle of Anghiari mural. On the right is an anatomical sheet from only two to three years later, painstakingly explaining the motor muscles of the lips that govern the gestures of the human mouth. The detailed anatomical drawing on the right gives new meaning to the term motor mouth. <laughs> Leonardo's drawings should be reconsidered for their rich complexity of technique and nuanced diversity of type. The syntax of his language should also be experienced against the heritage of Renaissance culture and systems of knowledge. 
It is useful to remember that by temperament, Leonardo ma never managed to fit within the traditions of production and socioeconomic structures of the Italian Renaissance. A painter's workshop in the Italian Renaissance was run pretty much like a business. Judged by, the, judged by such standards, Leonardo was a very picture of the flaky artist, especially in the last 20 years of his life. In service of Leonardo's work, his drawings have usually been grouped according to theme. For example, we're quite used to thinking about Leonardo's anatomical drawings as an isolated group unto itself. The same is true of his horse studies, maps, botanical and landscape drawings, studies of water and hydraulics. Strikingly, however, this fragmented approach largely buries for us the universality of Leonardo's vision and the gradual development of his unified thought. It may well be that the late works of Leonardo are what we like least of his total output. Many of Leonardo's endeavors during his last years were as difficult to appreciate for his contemporaries as they seem today for a modern public, if for different reasons. On the left is an accurate, if slightly repulsive, early 16th century copy after Leonardo's Mona Lisa. To many of Leonardo's contemporaries, the key masterpieces of his late years seem to have been unavailable in the original. Leonardo began painting the original panel of the Mona Lisa in Florence around 1503, but he never delivered it to the patron who commissioned it, no doubt because the work remained unfinished for a very long time. The artist took it to Rome in 1513-1516, where Raphael sought it for inspiration in his portrait of Baldassare Castiglionis that you see on your right. The Mona Lisa went with Leonardo to France in 1516-1570. There, Leonardo finally gave it to his pupil, Gian Giacomo Caprotti di Oreno, called Salai. As an inventory of property proves, Salai still owned the, painting, the painted panel at the time of his violent death in 1524, along with Leonardo's famous Virgin and Child with St. Anne and the Lida and the Swan. In his biography of Leonardo in 1550 and 1568, Vasari described the Mona Lisa in breathtaking detail, down to her eyebrows and the pores of her flesh, without ever having seen the original. And you should know the Mona Lisa does not have eyebrows. The picture was certainly not in Florence during Giorgio Vasari's lifetime. Generations of scholars in the 19th and 20th centuries have faced the enormous complexity of disentangling Leonardo's contribution from that of his imitators. On the left, you see a detail from a copy after one of Leonardo's caricatures, a drawing that is in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It may have been drawn by Francesco Melzi, another of Leonardo's pupils and his chief artistic heir at the great master's death in 1519. At first sight, the Metropolitan Museum drawing appears deceptively like Leonardo's autograph caricatures, such as the one that you see on the right. The Met copy on the left even carefully imitates Leonardo's left-handed strokes, but their awkwardness is easily apparent under the microscope. On the left is now the partly autographed late painting of St. John the Baptist at the Louvre, usually dated between 1513 and 1517. On the right is a detail from the original painting of the Mona Lisa, reworked by Leonardo from 1503 onward, and which hangs in a nearby room at the Musée du Louvre. This comparison helps us notice that the issue of our own taste in historical terms also often complicates our appreciation of the late works by Leonardo. It is a very real fact that even Leonardo's autograph late works often seem to us to be too abstract in their illustration of precisely observed optical and anatomical phenomena they often appear to represent stylized types rather than flesh and blood human beings. 
Even critics sympathetic to Leonardo's late work have recalled from some of his paintings and drawings perceiving an artificial academicism in the artist's vocabulary of gesture and in his nuanced calibration of light and shadow. In Leonardo's case, the imitation of his style and inno innovative techniques by his pupils obviously led sometimes to great contributions, as we shall see later. But the manifold replication of a Leonardesque style in the hands of inferior artists has also inevitably detracted from our appreciation of the master's own late work. Broadly speaking, Leonardo understood painting as the imitation of nature first and foremost, and he took it for granted that the observable principles of nature could be distilled into a detailed set of rules and skills that could be taught to pupils. From around 1483 onward, Leonardo would keep an ever-expanding circle of pupils, servants, practical workshop assistants, and associates. On the left, the drawing by Francesco Melzi is signed and dated 10th of August, 1510. The young artist dutifully gave his own age, 17 years old, on the top of the sheet. Descending from a well-to-do family in Milan, Francesco Melzi came to live with Leonardo in 1508 during the master's second stay in Milan. At Leonardo's death in 1519, Melzi became the loyal compiler and preserver of Leonardo's drawings and notes. On the right are Leonardo's pedagogical studies of human proportion from around 1506. As you can see, Melzi's dryly rendered drawing is directly based on one of Leonardo's instantly recognizable male figural types. Although the art historical literature on Leonardo's drawings is immense, it seems that Leonardo's drawings have all too often been studied for their subject matter and intellectual content alone. Me we must stress that critical questions about the chronology of Leonardo's development as an artist, as a scientist and theorist still remain to be answered. And the rich complementary fabric of documentary, archeological and paleographic evidence still needs to be seen as a whole. Fortunately for us, Leonardo recorded dates and a memorandum on many of his notes and drawings. We should remember that Leonardo's father, said Piero d'Antonio da Vinci, was a notary by profession. Leonardo's grandfather and great-grandfather were also notaries, so this bureaucratic writing of notes with dates was in the family blood, so to speak. Let us now see how looking closely at the archaeological evidence in the originals of Leonardo's drawings can get us out of problems. The drawings on the screen were dated by the same art historian as being only about three years apart, and a good number of art historians have also dated them in the same year. On the left, you see the famous so-called self-portrait of Leonardo in the Biblioteca Reale of Turin, dated by Kenneth Clark in 1512 and more recently by an Italian art historian in 1515-1516. On the right, the head of an old man, also sometimes regarded as a self-portrait, was dated by Clark around 1515 and more recently by an, a, another English art historian as fi in 1514-1515. On looking at these two drawings of heads attentively, I hope that it is clear to you just how very different in conception they are. It seems difficult to accept that these two sheets could be considered more or less contemporary in date. The obvious inconsistency in dating can pass totally unnoticed to the reader of a book if reproductions of these two drawings are buried in the text at opposite ends and in black and white in a monograph on Leonardo. I would like to suggest that the Turin drawing seen on the left was probably done around 1500-1502, that is about 10 to 12 years earlier than has often been thought. It therefore offers a good starting point for a discussion of Leonardo's late drawings. By contrast, the study on the right suggests the expressive but quiet grandeur of Leonardo's black chalk drawing technique in the final years. 
By then, the artist no longer strove for a precision of form or an aesthetic of refined surfaces. The contours are approximate. Note the crude reinforcement lines on the nose. Right there. And the manner of rendering shadows is boldly tonal. The sheet on the right seems exactly cohesive in style and technique with the deluge drawings of 1517, 1519, the product of Leonardo's last years, and which we will discuss at the end of this talk. Regarding the issue of subject matter, it seems moot, at least to me, given the fragmentary state of the historical evidence, to attempt to prove that the Turin drawing seen here on the left is indeed a self-portrait in a literal sense, and even more so to attempt to calculate the age of the sitter, something art historians love doing. To quote the 16th century inscription on the bottom of the sheet, but which is not in Leonardo's hand, this is a self-portrait of the artist as an old man. And it's right there. From Antonio de Beatis' eyewitness account of his visit to Leonardo's studio on the 10th of October in 1517, we know that the great master looked much older than his years and that he suffered from par paralysis of his right side, which impaired his ability to paint but not to draw. De Beatis, who was secretary to Cardinal Luis of Aragon and whose job was therefore to have a fairly good social eye, stated that Leonardo was over 70 years old. In reality, the master was only 65, and most 16th century sources get the age of Leonardo's death wrong. It seems that scholars have often dated the Turin drawing according to the sitter's purported age, rather than on the internal evidence of drawing style and technique. Leonardo was born in 1452, and according to the traditional hypothesis, he would be about 60 to 61 years old in the Turin drawing. According to the stylistic redating of the sheet that we will outline below, however, if we were to accept this as a literal self-portrait, the sitter would have to be about 48 to 50 years old, which is not out of the question. The image in the Turin drawing on the left is that of the pensive magus, or wizard, weighed down by the power of his inner vision, actually a type recognizable in various guises in Leonardo's drawings. It is also the type seen as a philosopher who is probably to ident be identified with Plato in Raphael's School of Athens. That philosopher was said to be modeled after the likeness of Leonardo. Here, for a better comparison, to note the similar direction of the lighting, I show you on the right a detail from Raphael's full-scale drawing for the School of Athens, which you can actually see when you visit the Pinacoteca Ambrosiana in Milan. The fresco was begun no earlier than 1508 and was finished at the latest in 1512. It is worth keeping in mind, therefore, that apparently Raphael's and Leonardo's paths intersected only between 1503 and 1508 in Florence, and later only between 1513 and 1516 in Rome. So the figure type seen in Leonardo's Turin drawing must have been known to Raphael by his Florentine period, that is by 1506-1508. And there's the figure. Now on the right, you see a portrait of Leonardo in Windsor that has a good probability of being a relatively authentic likeness, but by a closely contemporary right-handed artist, possibly Francesco Melzi. The drawing on the right appears to be a copy after a lost original. Sensitively execute, executed, but by no means a masterper, masterpiece of the caliber of Leonardo's Turin drawing, the portrait on the right seems to have been the source of a great many 16th century portraits of Leonardo, beginning with those by Giovio and Vasari. Um, the light brown spotting throughout the Turin sheet is foxing a problem of condi condition that we can ignore and all that, those freckles. On the right is a very enlarged detail to show you the orderly manner of diagonal parallel hatching in shadows. The lines go from upper left to lower right as is typical of Leonardo's left handedness. I ask you to hold this detail in your mind's eye, especially the diagonal parallel hatching. And you can see it. 
Notice also the lightness of the overall form of the head on the page. By contrast, as you will see, Leonardo's style of drawing, certainly by 1506, emphasized the sculptural massiveness of form with deep tonal rendering and heavy smudging of the chalk or charcoal to create sfumato, an effect of seamlessly blended tone. We can sum up the drawing style of Leonardo's sheet in Turin with a series of quick comparisons. The key stylistic evidence is offered by Leonardo's pen and ink drawings from the early to mid 1490s, and I show you an example on the right. Next is the head of a grotesque man seen in profile, a small sheet that is at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. The overall relief-like conception of form on the page and an orderly use of diagonal parallel hatching appear also in the magnificent large sheet of caricatures in the Royal Library in Windsor. The drawing in red chalk that seems closest in date to the Turin self-portrait is a much smaller, less finished sheet of studies, probably from 1501-1502, that is reasonably thought to portray Cesare Borgia in the Biblioteca Reale of Turin. Most importantly, since both drawings that you can now see on the screen are in the same museum, one can compare the original side by side with particular precision. The style of red chalk drawing in both Turin sheets is also quite close to the topographic studies in the Madrid Codex too, whose contents are again rightly dated to 1501-1502. Leonardo's presumed portrait of Cesare Borgia seen on the right serves to remind us also of the artist's precarious position in the political climate of his time. The city of Milan fell in December 1499 to Louis XII, who became king of France. And with the expulsion of the Sforza, the ruling family of Milan, Leonardo had found himself without patron patronage or a home in 1500. In 1502, during his service as a military engineer to Cesare Borgia, Leonardo produced a map of the town of Imola, southeast of Bologna and the northernmost post in the territories confiscated by Cesare for the Papal States. The slide on your left. Exquisitely drawn with watercolor, this presentation map was the most accurately measured and beautiful of its time. I should say also that the sketches for this map show that Leonardo must have been holding a sheet of paper and pacing, physically walking through the lengths of the town of uh, Imola um, along the axes. On your right, the design for a military defense from 1503-1504 was also probably intended as a presentation piece for a patron to judge from the clean manner of drawing. Seen in a tunneling perspective, the rain of stones fired by a row of mortars into the courtyard of a fort has a strangely surrealistic sense of immediacy. In his renewed experiences as a military engineer, Leonardo more attentively adhered to the tradition of illustration in typical 15th century treatises on military architecture without sacrificing his obviously unparalleled powers of description. On the screen are pages from Roberto Valturio's manuscript De Re Militari from 1446-1455. Also printed in 1483, this is the most famous treatise of the time and Leonardo owned a copy of it. On the left, the boldly, dra boldly drawn map of the Arno River in pen and ink and washes is full of reinforcement lines in the charcoal underdrawing. It was probably prepared largely on site. In 1503-1504, during the siege of the city of Pisa, the Florentines sought to divert the Arno River to the sea by canalization around the city, and that scheme was favored also by Niccolò Machiavelli, the famous author of The Prince and also one of Leonardo's patrons. The drawing is quite messy in appearance. In it, the outlines of the path of the river and its arteries are pricked and rubbed with carbon pouncing dust for transfer onto another surface. 
This highly functional drawing helps us visualize the type of working draft that Leonardo used in preparing the clean synthetic final presentation drawings of maps pristinely drawn with pen and ink and pale watercolors. Of some interest, the writing on the working draft is scrawled with Leonardo's usual right to left mirror handwriting. But the beautiful presentation drawing in watercolor seen on your right bears handwriting left to right, which we, like Renaissance patrons for whom the map was intended, could easily read. This normal left to right writing is also by Leonardo. When Leonardo left Milan for Venice in the winter of 1500, he apparently stopped in Mantua, where he prepared the famous portrait cartoon of Isabella d'Este, seen on the left. He drew this large portrait in the full scale of a final painting with a delicate technique in charcoal, lead point, red chalk, and pastels on paper prepared with a very fine layer in lead white for a seamless blending of tone and color. The overall feeling of the drawing on the page is so much airier than my slides suggest. The Isabella d'Este represents one of the first applications of the technique of drawing in pastels in Italy. As we can already infer from Leonardo's map drawings and the Isabella d'Este cartoon, the innovative use of color and tone in his graphic oeuvre of 1500 and after would lead to an astonishing legacy in Lombardy and Tuscany, one that would gradually reach all over the Italian peninsula. To underline the impact of Leonardo's new pastel technique in Lombardy, we may compare the Isabella d'Este cartoon to a portrait drawing by Bernardino Luini of about 1522-1534 seen on the right. This sitter is thought to be Ippolita Sforza Bentivoglio. The two portrait drawings in pastel by Giovanni Antonio Boltraffio, now on the screen, are of a date much closer to Leonardo's Isabella d'Este, around 1500-1502. Finally, the pastel drawing of a bearded figure, possibly Christ, by Andrea Solario at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, dates from the artist's final years in 1520-1524. Let us now elaborate on the impact of Leonardo's artistic legacy in Florence. Shortly after 1500, 1501, Leonardo returned to Florence after an absence of nearly 17 years. One of the ways in which Leonardo reestablished himself in the cutthroat art market of Florence was by publicly exhibiting an unsolicited monumental work of art. This is extremely rare. Most works in the Renaissance were commissioned. A cartoon or full-scale drawing portraying the Virgin and Child with Saint Anne and a Lamb. That work, which Fra Pietro da Novellara, head of the Carmelites in Florence, described so carefully in a letter from 1501 to Isabella d'Este, has not survived. But we may judge Leonardo's exquisite drawing manner from the cartoon in the National Gallery in London seen on the left. It depicts a similar subject and has almost life-size figures, but it probably dates from 1508. A scaled preliminary study for the London cartoon is also extant and seen on the right. Leonardo's lost cartoon enjoyed the wondrous critical reception normally reserved for finished works of art. According to Giorgio Vasari's Life of Leonardo, for two days, Crowds of artists, women, and laymen came to admire Leonardo's cartoon in his private quarters at Santissima Annunziata. Already with the public exhibition of Leonardo's Virgin and Child with St. Anne cartoons, had clearly, cartoons had clearly ceased to be regarded as mere working drawings and had acquired the additional function of being a type of presentation drawing. As you can now see on the screen, Leonardo's early exploratory drawings on the theme of the Virgin and Child with Saint Anne already demonstrate that movement and compositional unity were increasingly dominant artistic concerns for him. The artist fluently exchanged one idea for another, often also reversing the orientation of his designs left to right or right to left in apparently endless variation. 
He conceived the composition as an organic whole from the earliest stage of its development. A similar reception to that of the famous St. Anne cartoon awaited the cartoons for the murals which were planned in 1503 and 1504 for the Great Council Hall of the Palazzo Vecchio, Leonardo's Battle of Anghiari competing with Michelangelo's Battle of Cascina. Seen on the left, Leonardo's spirited preliminary sketch in charcoal for the right portion of the lost Battle of Anghiari cartoon already takes into account the spectator's vantage point with respect to the placement of the mural composition. The so-called Tavola Doria on the right records a portion of the Battle of Anghiari mural that Leonardo began to paint in the Council Hall of the Palazzo Vecchio, and all that is completely lost, and the room in the Palazzo Vecchio has been completely remodeled, so it's not worth even showing a slide of it. Early 16th century artists prepared designs in a fairly orderly process, which Giorgio Vasari described in the introduction to the lives of the most eminent artists of 1550 and 1568. According to Vasari, artists first drew schizzi, that sketches. These resembled, and I quote him, the form of a blotch, and were a rough draft of the compositional idea, and again I quote him, to find the manner of the poses. Seen now on the screen, Leonardo's sheets of pen and ink sketches for the Battle of Anghiari exemplify the extemporaneous and abstract quality of this drawing type. He produced the Battle of Anghiari sketches essentially from memory. The furia of invention prevailed over the precision of pictorial notation. Leonardo apparently welcomed the stream of consciousness solutions arising from the process of exploration itself. His approach to narrative invention at the, step, at the step of the rough compositional sketch was a great conceptual breakthrough in the history of Renaissance art and we would argue also for modern art. Leonardo's justly famous passage in Paris Manuscript A from 1490, it exhorts young apprenticing painters to look further at the suggestive forms of stains and variegated patterns on stones to open up the mind's eye to various pictorial inventions. And specifically about the sketching of initial ideas, he emphasized freshness. I quote him, let your sketches of historical pictures be swift and the working out of the limbs not be carried too far, but limited to their positioning. End of Leonardo's quote. Leonardo also recommended the use of small sketchbooks for a nearly journalistic observation of the human figure to be recorded in a shorthand notation, practically stick figures. Again, I quote Leonardo, and with slight strokes, take a note in a little book which you should always carry with you. The forms and positions of objects are so infinite that the memory is incapable of retaining them. Keep these sketches as your guides and masters. End of Leonardo's quote. Sadly, a step-by-step -step discussion of the art of drawing is not forthcoming from Leonardo's own notes, and thus it's really difficult for us to reconcile his notions of design sequence with Vasari's model. It may well be that Leonardo's elabor elaboration of more finished studies beyond composition sketches remained very flexible in approach, as is suggested by the diversity of type in the preliminary drawings for individual motifs in the Battle of Anghiari. The figure drawings from the Anghiari period reveal a remarkably nuanced study of surface, as in the man seen from behind, seen on the left slide in the screen, where the primary concern is with the effect of soft skin over muscular structure. By the time that he abandoned the Battle of Anghiari project in 1506, Leonardo had already resumed anatomical research with great energy. On the right is a breathtaking sheet from 1506-1507 with comparative studies of the legs of man and horse. It must have been among the earliest anatomical drawings done by Leonardo at this very moment. 
Leonardo's portrayal of facial types gained in psychological grandeur as he increased the scale of his preparatory studies for the Battle of Anghiari. On the left is a sheet of red chalk studies for the figure that is possibly Pier Giampaolo Orsini, the Florentine general sent to capture the standard of the Florentine Republic from Milanese's hands. Its overall effect is quite delicate. It may have been among the earliest such head studies for the Anghiari composition. Leonardo turned to charcoal, the medium also of the final cartoon, to prepare the studies for the head of the figure presumed to be Niccolo Piccinino, the Milanese general beaten in battle by the Florentines and for the, Flor the profiles of the adjoining soldiers. You see that sheet on the right. Both drawings are in Budapest. After such preliminary studies, and according to practices that were already typical by the mid-15th century, artists enlarged the design of a composition to full scale by drawing a carefully rendered cartoo cartone, or a cartoon in English. As the reasoning went, Leon Battista Alberti had already formulated it in his painting treatise of 1435, a drawing in large scale shows more easily errors in design than a drawing in a small scale. On the left is an exter exterior view of what the Sala del Papa looks like today. This is a place in the Chiostro Grande of Santa Maria Novella in Florence where Leonardo drew the Battle of Anghiari cartoon. The original of Leonardo's cartoon does not survive. And so on the right, you see a crude early 16th century fragment copying the head of the figure of Niccolo Piccinino in Leonardo's lost Anghiari cartoon. The head seen in this fragmentary copy seems to be in the actual scale of Leonardo's lost cartoon. And if you look at me for a moment, it's about that big, the head. Now on the right is Leonardo's cartoon from 1503, the grotesque figure sometimes identified with Vasari's description of Scaramuccia, captain of the gypsies. It must have probably been very similar in drawing technique to the lost Anghiari cartoon. The bold manner of rendering in charcoal with aggressively hatched strokes, selective stumping in the flesh areas and vigorous reinforcement lines is typical of Leonardo's larger scale drawings. The outlines of the design are pricked for transfer. We can envision the overall impact of at least the central portion of Leonardo's Lost Battle of Anghiari cartoon from Peter Paul Rubens' spirited drawing seen on the left, although it is now considered a copy several degrees removed. The Battle of Anghiari resonates in Leonardo's own sketch for the presentation drawing of Neptune, which the artist gave to his friend Antonio Segni, who was also Botticelli's frequent patron. That drawing appears on your right. Leonardo's enormously influential contribution to an aesthetic of surface treatment began to take shape during his second Florentine period and was firmly rooted in his training with the great sculptor Andrea Verrocchio in the 1460s and 1470s. We may compare a detail from Leonardo's London cartoon on the left to a cartoon fragment of an angel's head by Verrocchio on the right. Verrocchio's extraordinary understanding of chiaroscuro remained largely intuitive. By 1500, in contrast, Leonardo derived, Leonardo's chiaroscuro derived from an exacting, astonishingly modern scientific method. Between 1490 and 1492, as several Paris manuscripts can attest, Leonardo had begun to study empirically the physical properties of light and the gradations of shadows, their quality, quantity, position, and shape. On the right is one such double page from manuscript A. As later put forth, particularly in par Paris manuscript E, the observations provided a basis for Leonardo's theory on the perspective of disappearance, the optical phenomena guiding the perception of form, translucency, opacity, and distance. 
These findings would translate into a nuanced artistic vocabulary as Leonardo's painting palette grew increasingly monochromatic and his style of drawing gained an expressive force. Here, a starting point was a subtle study in Windsor for the Madonna of the Yarnwinder, the prototype of which appears to have been begun in 1501 for a French patron, and that painting no longer survives in the original. On the left is now a detail from Leonardo's study for the head of the Virgin at the Metropolitan Museum of Art from 1510-1512. And on the right is a detail of the Mona Lisa, reworked by the artist from 1503 onward. As we can see from the study on the left, Leonardo's exquisite application of the sfumato drawing technique, although he was not its inventor, was a direct response to his research on the seamless modeling of form. The artist used stumping, the smudging of the chalk or charcoal with the fingers or a piece of cloth to blend in strokes or tones without any noticeable transitions, auso di fumo, in the manner of smoke, as Leonardo called it in Paris Manuscript A. Now on the left is a detail from a large cartoon by Raphael from 1510, and on the right is a composition study by Fra Bartolomeo, another artist from 1507. These drawings can illustrate for us the impact of Leonardo's dramatic sfumato drawing technique on artists working in Florence at the time that Leonardo was preparing the influential cartoons for the Virgin and Child with St. Anne and the Battle of Anghiari. From 1504 to 1508, Leonardo's powers of invention, investigation, and evocation seemed inexhaustible, and these four years also possibly represent the most public phase of his career in Florence. At the time that Leonardo was abandoning the Battle of Anghiari for the great council hall of the Palazzo Vecchio, which by 1506 was vastly unfinished, he may have thought of carving a sculpture of the classical hero Hercules. Apparently, in the end, he did not execute the project. As a result of recently uncovered evidence, Leonardo's activity as a sculptor seems now like a fairly important but very mysterious aspect of his late career. That Leonardo had at one point contemplated a design of a Hercules was known to art historians from at least one, possibly two drawings in Turin, which you see in the slides at left and right. The sheet in Turin, illustrated at right, contains also studies for the warriors of the Battle of Anghiari composition. Thus. The drawing scene on the left shows a monumental Hercules from the back holding up his club and with a recumbent lion. In the fall of the year 2000, the Met acquired a small, virtually unknown double-sided sheet of sketches by Leonardo from around 1506-1508. And here I would like to mention only very briefly how the argument goes. On the left is an overall view of the recto of the new Met sheet, and on the right you see the verso. This double-sided sheet is probably a crop page from a notebook. The upper part of the recto seen in the left slide has very abstract sketches of the centrifugal swirling movement of water around obstacles and a view of water currents flowing by a wooden bridge. These hydraulic studies closely relate to pages from the so-called Codex Lester begun in 1506 and 1508 that are now in Bill Gates's collection. The sketch on the right side, a nude man sheathing or unsheathing a sword, is in the same quick pen and ink style as other drawings for the, for the Battle of Anghiari. Oh, excuse me, that is reversed. Toward the bottom right of the med sheet is a sketch in charcoal or soft black chalk. And here we see the muscular nude Hercules seen from the front standing and holding what appears to be a club in a horizontal position. On the verso of the sheet, the standing Hercules figure is seen from the rear. Because the new Met sheet at the, the portrays Hercules from the front and back, it seems quite clear that Leonardo intended the sketches for a sculpture. 
When the sheet is held up against the light, one can observe that the overall contours of the Hercules figure in frontal view on the recto and those of his rear view on the verso coincide perfectly. We can therefore deduce that the artist traced the figure through from one side of the sheet to the other, probably as a shortcut to preserve both the level of descriptive detail and the consistency of the design front to back. To judge from the med sheet, what seems strikingly new about Leonardo's conception of Hercules is his tense pose of alertness. This Hercules, standing vigilantly active in his repose and with an impressive physique, is quite anti-classical in mood. It seems to have influenced a number of later 16th century artists who worked in Florence. It is difficult to know what the intended final setting for Leonardo's Hercules sculpture was or whether it was to be small or large in scale. We can take an educated guess that it was monumental. Everyone at that particular moment in history, artists and patrons, everyone was thinking large, not small. Leonardo seems to have reinvented Hercules as an icon of preparedness. A similar allusion to civic vigilance occurs in Michelangelo's giant marble David, a figure representing liberty and the Christianized Hercules who embodies physical and moral strength. According to Vasari, the Gonfaloniere di Giustizia, Piero Soderini, had originally planned to give the marble block for the David to Leonardo. The David was finally commissioned from Michelangelo on the 16th of August 1501. On the left is Leonardo's small study for a Neptune, which, as you can see, offers a poignant reworking of Michelangelo's David in terms of the Herculean bodily ideal that Leonardo had come to prefer by 1507-1508. On the right, you see a detail of the Palazzo Vecchio in Florence today with a view of the Piazza della Signoria. Notice on the right the accurate 19th century copy of Michelangelo's David. The original is in the Academia. And on the opposite side, Baccio Bandinelli's Hercules group. To emphasize some of the complex evidence, Leonardo was among the artists and craftsmen who voiced their opinion on where to place Michelangelo's David on the 25th of January 1504, when it was finally voted that it should stand at the entrance of the Palazzo Vecchio facing the Piazza della Signoria, so as a copy is today. Moreover, from 1504 to 1508, Leonardo and Michelangelo had been the famous rivals in the mural projects for the Great Council Hall of the Palazzo Vecchio. In view of the already charged professional interaction between the two artists at this time, it is worth speculating that Leonardo may have conceived his Hercules sculpture with a civic function in mind and in competition with Michelangelo. Recently published documents suggest that Michelangelo seems to have been working on his own, own Hercules as a pendant to the newly sighted giant marble David as early as 1506. Michelangelo never got his Hercules project beyond a preliminary um, bozzetto in terracotta. At a much later date, from 1525 to 1534, Baccio Bandinelli would plan and produce such a figural group for the site, and which was reviled by many of his contemporaries for its weaknesses of design in comparison to Michelangelo's heroic David. Bandinelli, the author of the Hercules group that was actually executed, had been trained by a close associate of Leonardo, and Leonardo himself seems to have thought highly of the young Bandinelli's drawings. Therefore, the Hercules studies on the new med sheet provide a key piece of evidence for any reconstruction of Leonardo's activity as a sculptor. Leonardo's earliest ideas for a composition of Lida and the Swan also emerged during the final phase of his work on the unfinished Battle of Anghiari in late 1504 or 1505, probably stimulated by the problem of composing dynamic arrangements of intertwined figures. In the left slide, the simultaneity of conception is vividly apparent. A rearing horse for the Anghiari appears on the upper right. 
Below, the artist explored the kneeling pose of the monumental nymph Lida, tightly compressed within the picture field. The flux of gestating form is such that even in the most worked out sketch toward the center of the sheet, we cannot distinguish the other actors in Lida's story, the god Jupiter in the guise of the swan or the infant twins. The more finished composition pen studies may have served the purpose of demonstration for the patron. Oops. I think something's happened that I think it's just skipping. Oh, excuse me. Leonardo's finished painting was destroyed between 1694 and 1775. The extant painted copies suggest that, as would be true of his conception of the Sforza horse, when the artist resumed work on the Lida composition in 1514-1515, he would opt for a final solution that tamed agitated movement into classical restraint of gesture. On the right, you see the painted copy of Leonardo's Lida in the Galleria Borghese in Rome. Around 1507, Leonardo apparently executed the designs for the fantastic arrangement of Lida's hair. The designs were studied from different points of view and from an actual wig posed on a mannequin. Leonardo's recasting of the myth of Lida and the Swan speaks of the timeless notions of fecundity, generation, and birth. The artist undertook some of the most nuanced of his botanical studies in connection with his portrayal of the flowered meadow in the foreground of the Lida composition. Perhaps the most moving of Leonardo's research on anatomy, the study of the female body and the reproductive system was also begun at this time. On the left you see the earliest of these endeavors, the so-called Lady of Anatomy from 1507. It is a mon monumental work of synthesis based partly on dissection. The diagram conflates different modes of visual description. Some forms are rendered in section, others in transparency, and still others in opaque three-dimensionality to illustrate the principal organs of the woman with the vascular and urine urinogenital systems. On the right, you see another anatomical sheet from 1508-1509 explaining the workings of the bladder. Notice the simplified diagrammatic style of the drawing, of drawing form overall, despite the delicate quality of the line. In the next two years, Leonardo's anatomical drawings would attain an unprecedented level of descriptive detail with great expressive force. On the left is the justly famous drawing of the fetus in the womb from 1510-1511. Leonardo combined pen and dark brown ink with red and black chalks to create a deeply sculptural modeling of form. This is perhaps the most visually arresting image in the whole history of scientific illustration. Despite its veristic rendering of scientific content, the main study in the sheet and the scattered detail diagrams on the page incor incorporate an imaginary, highly stylized conception of the human placenta. Sponge-like cotyledons attach the placenta to the walls of the uro uterus, knowledge based on the dissection of animal fetuses. And I would like, these are the cotyledons that I'm talking about, and so they are found there as attachments. On the right is the earlier flatter style of anatomical drawing. It is a scientifically more valid diagram of the cow's embryo in the womb. You see the upside down cow, there's a head. So. From 1508 and reveals fully rendered cotyledons in the lower diagram pointing to the source of Leonardo's assumption about the counterpart in the human uterus. So those are the cotyledons, like the little spots. So he just translated what he saw in the cow to the human. 
feed us. Now on the left, the more immediate renditions of the fetus in the womb in frontal, side, and three-quarter views from 1510-1511. On the verse of the sheet, Leonardo wrote, and I quote, the child was less than half a braccio long, so it's about that long, and nearly four months old, end of Leonardo's quote. On the right is a drawing for the Trivulzio monument, which stylistically must be from the exact moment as the anatomical study seen on the left. Compare their similar medium of pen and ink with red and black chalks, although the functions and subject matter of the sheets are quite different. When Leonardo lived in Milan for the second time, between 1506 and 1513, his main preoccupation was the design of an equestrian monument for the tomb of Gian Giacomo Trivulzio, who had been appointed by the French co-governor of Milan. This is the second time Leonardo undertook a monumental equestrian portrait. Although Trivulzio did not die until 1518, his will, in 1507, made provisions for a funerary chapel at the Church of San Nazaro in Milan. The Trivulzio Equestrian Tomb Project never seems to have made it off the drawing board, not surprising for Leonardo. It is undocumented except for the extant drawings by Leonardo and a rough cost estimate of casting written in Leonardo's hand. By 1510, Leonardo's clarity of syntax in describing both the microcosmic complexity of three-dimensional form and its macrocosmic monumentality had achieved a unified elegance of visual language. It matched his powers of observation to those of his inventions. The anatomical drawings carried out in the short span of time from 1508 to 1510 are the moving testimony of this ordered microcosmic experience. Before his untimely death in 1511, the brilliant young anatomist at the University of Pavia, Marcantonio de la Torre, may well have directed Leonardo's method of dissection, for it now reached a singular coherence of vision. On the left, the portrayal of the flexible articulation of the human spine include general views from the side, front, and back, as well as blown up details of the vertebrae. And here I would like you to notice how he even aligns everything. On the lower left of the sheet, the vertebrae are axially pulled apart to explain their minute joining. On the right is a surface dissection of the muscles of the neck, shoulders, and arms in rotated sequential views of nearly cinematic effect. Contrasting with the microcosmic complexity of anatomical description was for Leonardo the macrocosmic power of nature and the human intellect. A visionary project for a monumental mausoleum in the antique style is seen on the right. It seems to have been based on an actual Etruscan tomb type that had been excavated in Tuscany about 1508. The drawing is neatly laid out in panoramic perspective, plan, and blown up detail, and the architectural elements are carefully constructed with stylus and ruler. The landscape around the man-made mountain spreads into boundless space. Leonardo's experience of rendering anatomical findings had clearly brought order to the unlocked fantasia of invention. The anatomical drawings executed between 1508 and 1512 are undoubtedly the greatest work of Leonardo's second Milanese period. The only extant painting that Leonardo finished in Milan at this time seems to have been the second version of the Virgin of the Rocks, now in the National Gallery in London. It must have been installed by 1508 in the Church of San Francesco il Grande. Offering a rich diversity of type, the extant studies for the Madonna and Child with St. Anne at the Musée du Louvre in Paris from 1512 to 1512 
can illustrate the role of Leonardo's increasingly complex pictorial techniques of drawing. In the drapery studies connected with the Louvre composition, the artist would experiment with highly unusual and not always successful combinations of drawing media, quite diverse in color and composition, to attain effects of modeling that seem luminous, chromatically saturated, and seamlessly built up. Begun in charcoal, the Windsor drapery study seen in the left slide for the seated figure of the Virgin is refined to a, hi to a high luster only on the small area of her right thigh with a layer of brown wash and thick white gouache highlights. Here, the combination of powdery charcoal and liquid gouache seem disjointed and the smeared middle gray tones seem almost blue in hue. I must say I don't really like this drawing very much. On the right, the Louvre study for the Virgin's lower body focuses on the effects of luster with eerie precision. The layers of charcoal, brown wash, and white gouache highlights on the large expanse of the lap are thoroughly blended in a meticulous, tight modeling of form. In the drapery study on the right, the overall quality of the light is rich in color and intensity, but static in its clarity of gradation as it falls across the shallow, abstracted folds on the Virgin's lap. Particularly in the late drawing seen in the right slide, the chromatic range that can be discerned from the juxtapositions of warm and cool tones in the highlights and shadows attains a visual equivalent of Leonardo's enormously complex descriptions of natural and colorlit sources on opaque bodies. The head studies for the composition are simply extraordinary. Of the figures in the composition of the Louvre painting, Saint Anne is placed in the plane furthest in the distance of the pictorial space. Consequently, Leonardo's treatment of the saint in the large bustling study in Windsor, which appears to be in the same scale as a painting, focuses on the atmospheric dissolution of her relief-like forms. This broadly conforms with the observable phenomenon of disappearing edges in the secondary planes of a perspectival space. It is a subject that Leonardo amply discussed in Paris Manuscript E and the posthumously compiled Codex Urbinas. For the Windsor study, Leonardo relied on an unusually soft silvery charcoal or black chalk that was easily smudged to articulate broad continuous planes. His manner of drawing was impressionistic. Closely related to the Windsor sheet in scale, study, and style, and technique, but greatly more finished, is a bust length study for the Virgin in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. In comparison to the Windsor St. Anne that we just saw, the rendering of the Virgin's forms in the Metropolitan Museum sheet is more precisely defined, for in the composition, her figure is placed closer to the viewer's eye than St. Anne. The charcoal drawing is exquisitely reworked with red chalk, especially evident in the face, but also extending less noticeably to the locks of hair in the underdrawing. There is a red chalk in the drawing. One of the most amazing things to see is to see this drawing under a microscope because the blending of all the layers of chalk is absolutely seamlessly unified, just like smoke, to use Leonardo's words. Both bust length studies, the Metropolitan Museum Virgin in its inclusion of color and the Windsor St. Anne in its omission of color, represent broadly Leonardo's principles on the perspective of color and the loss of local color with distance. In terms of the study of Leonardo's drawings, the last five years of his life present great problems. As wicked gossip would have it at the Pope's court, Leonardo may have done very little in his years in Rome between 1513 and 1516, beside researching the optical effects of mirror, mirrors, distilling varnishes, and endlessly reworking paintings. There he was employed by Giuliano de' Medici, brother to Pope Leo X. 
Toward the end of 1516, Leonardo seems to have accepted the invitation of the King of France, Francis I, to his court to go to his court at Amboise, about two hours south of Paris. Leonardo was working on the royal palace for the king already in January 1517. A number of figural drawings seem to date from the French period. The recent restoration campaign of Leonardo's drawings at the Royal Win Library in Windsor unexpectedly turned up at least five watermark types that help us establish the redating of those sheets. Among the drawings now thought to belong to Leonardo's French period is a series of studies for yet another equestrian monument, which otherwise remains undocumented. On the left is one of these horse studies. It dates from around 1517. Before the evidence of the watermarks was discovered, such sheets were thought to relate to the equestrian monument of Gian Giacomo Trivulzio. On stylistic grounds alone, this group in silvery hues with fairly smudged outlines and an atmospheric conception of form would seem difficult to reconcile with the Trivulzio drawings, which exhibit a considerably tightly plastic conception of form. The magical, beautiful designs for masquerade costumes in Windsor also probably date from Leonardo's last years in France, and on the right is one such masquerade study. Another beautiful pair of designs for such courtly diversions is now seen on the screen. Also forming part of this late group of drawings is a whims whimsical dragon costume seen on the left, which must have been intended for the performance of a pa pageant or mask. Here it is worth remembering that in 1515, Leonardo gave King Francis I of France an ingenious toy mechanical lion that spewed fleur-de-lis from its mouth. As Martin Kem has demonstrated, Leonardo understood imagination as fantasia, the ability to recombine images or parts of images into wholly new compounds. The remarkable sheet of sketches on the right, usually dated around 1517, portrays cats, lions, and dragons. It is inscribed by Leonardo at the top, and I quote him, on bending and extension. The lion is prince of this animal species because the joints of its spinal cord are bendable, end of quote. In the drawings, Leonardo transmogrified the curving poses of real and imagined animals with a seamlessly veristic description of form. As championed by Leon Battista Alberti's treatise of 1435, in a brief comparison between the arts of painting and poetry, the fertility of invenzione would gradually become the yardstick for measuring artistic creativity. So this is a Renaissance attempt to define genius. Since classical antiquity, poetry had already been assessed in such terms, invention of subject matter and composition. In his courtly discussions on the paragone or comparison of the arts in the early 1490s, Leonardo had playfully argued the superiority of the painter over the poet because, and I quote him, the imagination cannot see with such excellence as the eye. It is clear that in his late drawings, Leonardo's powers of fantasia would achieve a poetic, elegiac dimension. On the left, an earlier sheet from around 1513 portrays the unrelated motifs of a seated, pensive old man and studies of the patterns of flow of water around obstacles. On the right, the studies of on the unobstructed movement of water demonstrate the behavior of water in pattern-like dispositions. The accurately observed hydraulic studies in pen and ink of the early 15 teens would certainly amplify the expressive content of the group of 10 deluge drawings in Windsor. These were probably executed during the last two years of Leonardo's life in 1517-1519. They represent Leonardo's final graphic production. 
Although unfinished, the drawing on the left portrays a vision of the destructive forces of nature in especially narrative terms. The tidal waves of the waters mercilessly swallow up rocks, trees, men, and horses on the lower right. There, the arrangement of the tiny groups of struggling men and horses is not unlike those in the much earlier Battle of Anghiari. As with his writing of a painting treatise, so with his language of drawing, Leonardo's approach had been, above all, structural. In Leonardo's words, and I quote him, first simple beams, then those supported from below, and lastly, those supporting other weights, end of quote. If for Leonardo, the language of drawing forged visual order in both creative process and scientific exploration, it also charted the possibilities for expression in and of itself. With his language, Leonardo could, and I quote him, invent a fiction with a signifying purpose to paraphrase him in the Paragone. Preliminary composition drawings could suggest emblems and moral allegories. Life studies of the human head and anatomical drawings could give rise to caricatures. Topographic notes, maps, and landscape studies could yield to cataclysmic prof prophecies. Thank you.